Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Robin Silvestri, and I'm the executive director for Save the Great South Bay. We welcome to you to our quarterly speaker series. It, today's speaker series is called um, Creeks as Classrooms, Bridging um, in Education and Local Stewardship. Save the Great South Bay is a 501c3 nonprofit located here on the South Shore of Long Island. We, our, our mission is to protect and preserve the Great South Bay, which is under assault. It's really under attack from an overload of nitrogen, which causes algal blooms and uh, brown tides and red tides, mahogany tides out there in the bay. Um, that's that. Um, block the sunlight reaching the, the ground and therefore kill off uh, marine life that is essential to the ecosystem of the bay and the health of the bay. Uh, why is this important to us? This is important to us as, as all Long Islanders because the health of the bay, our economies depend upon it, our, our um, home values depend upon it, and the success of Long Island really depends upon it. We use the bay for recreation, for commerce, and for many other purposes. So it's really important that the bay stay healthy and, um, and in, in good shape for not only for us to enjoy now, but for future generations to enjoy. So the Save the Great South Bay achieves our mission through three primary programs, plus our advocacy and education um, efforts. Uh, our, our programs include the Great South Bay Oyster Project, by which we are restoring oysters to the Great South Bay in collaboration with the town of Islip Hatchery, the town of Islip, SeaTuck Environmental, uh, Cornell Cooperative, and the Gino Macchio Foundation. We're putting uh, we're putting oysters back in the bay um, for them to provide their natural filtration function and provide a second line of defense against uh, storm surge. We uh, we additionally have a program uh, that focuses on habitat restoration, and this is uh, where we say that the bay is just a symptom. It's really the mainland of Long Island that is sick. And the nitrogen that flows and affects the bay, that flows into the bay, stems from Long Island. The, uh, the vast majority of this nitrogen comes from cesspools, um, outdated cesspools that simply are holding tanks that leach nitrogen into the ground that eventually makes its way to the, to the bay. A secondary source of nitrogen pollution for the bay is lawn fertilizers. Uh, chemical laden lawn fertilizers get caught up in the runoff and uh, the runoff all makes its way into the bay. Every storm drain in um, across the Long Island makes its way to uh, anything south of the expressway makes its way into the bay. Our third, sorry, excuse me, our fourth, um, our fourth a third program is our Creek Defender Program, which is a highly popular program that runs across the South Shore of Long Island. There are 16 towns and villages that span from Massapequa to Mastic Beach. And uh, in each of these towns and villages, we have appointed a Creek Defender. This Creek Defender um, rallies their local communities, including students, um, rotary clubs, pu public libraries, public libraries, um, uh, to to gather volunteers to go out and patrol the creeks, clean up along them, and um, and keep an eye out for invasive species that need to be removed. So that is uh, that is basically what Safe Creek South Bay does in order to protect and preserve the bay. And today we're here to talk about um, how do we bring those messages and how do we incorporate those programs into our local school curriculums. So with me here today, um, I'd like to welcome first our um, president of the board of directors of the organization, Todd Shaw is on the line. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Todd. Hi, Robin. Thank you. Good morning. Did you want to say good morning to everybody? Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, I guess this is our third uh, of the year and we have one more left. I guess you could kind of talk a little bit about, uh, I guess, before we introduce everybody, that we do have one more um, in October, I believe, uh, with uh, with Chris Gobler as well. So, thank you for joining us. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you, Todd. Thanks so much for that. Um, also joining us today, we have a, a distinguished panel, uh, including Melissa Griffiths Parrot Paro. Um, from the Central Pine Barrens Commission. She's the Director of Education and Outreach and also a co-founder of A Day in the Life of a River program. 
Uh, Melissa has served in the environmental education field for more than 20 years, including work with the Sweetbriar Nature Center in Smithtown, Cornell Cooperative Extension, and numerous environmental and educational organizations and boards. Uh, Melissa is responsible for the Commission's many educational and outreach efforts, along with the Brookhaven National Lab and the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. She has spearheaded the renowned Day in the Life of a River program uh, for that reaches out over various rivers and estuary um, field research programs for local secondary school district students, um, including a very successful Barrens to the Bay Environmental Summer Camp and Discovery Day, the Commission's annual Pine Barrens Public Education event. So thank you very much for joining us today, Melissa. We appreciate your time. Additionally joining us is Lou Siegel. Lou is the president of the New York State Marine Educators Association. He began teaching marine science in 1969 at the experimental John Dewey High School in Brooklyn. He actively trained his students to take good advantage of the new federal, state, and local laws of the 1970s, including the Clean Water and Clean Air Acts and the newly minted Environmental Protection Agency. During the 1980s, he was the chairperson of the Science and Oceanography at the Waterfront Beach Channel High School. And he continued to, as his work as a chairperson of science and technology at Oceanside High School, where he began teaching graduate um, and began teaching graduate and undergraduate science courses at several local colleges. Uh, from 2003 to 2018, uh, Lou was the uh, science coordinator of the South Shore Estuary Reserve, and he is the founder and current president of the 48-year-old New York State Marine Education Association. So thank you for bringing all of your experience and knowledge with us today, Lou. We're looking forward to hearing about the New York State Marine Education programs and how our local school district teachers can participate in them. And finally, our third panelist is Robert, Robert Vassiluth, who is an eelgrass restoration expert. Uh, uh, Rob came to the environmental world after a devastating experience on 9-11, uh, where he committed himself thereafter to, to saving life, which for him meant uh, becoming an a, a staunch environmentalist and working in the area of eelgrass restoration. Uh, Rob is an operating engineer skilled with working heavy equipment, uh, age 53, and the father of three local, local students. He has invented a hugely important process for bringing back um, that vital aquatic vegetation eelgrass which plays an essential role in the, um, the ecosystem of the Great South Bay. He has brought this program to classrooms as a way of engaging students in the restoration process. And he has worked with um, Nature Conservancy's Carl Labou, uh, director of the New York Ocean Programs and on the eelgrass efforts off Fire Island. And we're really glad to hear that Rob is continuing his efforts in the Great South Bay. So thank you, Rob, for joining us today. We look forward to hearing more about your programs. Thank you. And to moderate our panel, good morning. To moderate our panel today, we um, we are thrilled to welcome investigative reporter from News Twelve, Danielle Campbell, who will um, who will lead our discussion. Danielle has been a, an active supporter of Save the Great South Bay for many years now, and is um, is is intricately um, aware of many of the environmental issues that affect the Great South Bay. She has helped us uh, spread that message to Long Islanders and um, uh, both on the the resident and commercial side, as well as helping us connect with. Uh, local local leadership across the island. So thank you, Danielle, so much for taking some time this morning to help lead our discussion. Uh, I'm going to turn the mic over to you, Danielle. Uh, Danielle, you may be on mute. Okay. Hi, good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I'm here at my home. I'm on one of our beautiful estuaries. Uh, the Mauritius Bay, which um, is, of course, another bay that is uh, in trouble as well, maybe not quite as badly as the Great South Bay, but um, also has its issues with algal blooms and uh, declining, you know, uh, well, we've had like a little bit of a fish kill over here and, you know, hypoxia and things like that. Um, so I guess we'll start with uh, Melissa. 
who is going to explain a little bit about her program. And I, I just want to say, save this when Save the Great South Bay started, it was so exciting for me as a journalist because um, although many of you, uh, maybe not Lou, I mean, uh, Robert, but you know, we're, we're paid to do what we do, right? I'm paid to be a journalist, cover stories that are important to Long Islanders, Long Islanders, but Save the Great South Bay, it's grassroots volunteers taking stewardship over where they live. And that I think is the biggest message we can give to our students to believe, to care about where they live and to take action as well. And, and that's what all of you are doing. And I do appreciate it so much. And Save the Great South Bay is really one of the groups on Long Island that have led the way in communities taking responsibility. Just recently, I did a wonderful story where Save the Great South Bay um, cleaned up, uh, it was it Nattle, Rattlesnake Creek? Rattles, I think so. <laughs> Rattlesnake Creek, yeah. Rattlesnake right. Creek, oh, which yeah. was devastating to see. It was behind um, Sunrise Toyota. And there were dumped tires, television sets piled into this creek, garbage bags. I mean, how many television sets? I mean, it had to be... <laughs> 30 of them. Yeah, yeah. Um, there were hundreds of tires. It was crazy. It was really insane. And uh, the community went in there and cleaned up that dump site. And that's something I've seen across Long Island. I've covered stories about people dumping into our creeks, our waterways. Uh, I had helped the Lake Ronkonkoma group form. I did a story at Lake Ronkonkoma about the history and just a quick story. The historian told me, I'm embarrassed to take you down to Lake Ronkonkoma. And I was, I said, why? And she said, it's become a dumping ground. And I said to her, well, we're going to clean it up. Um, I have family that lived at Lake Ronkonkoma. And as a journalist, Long Island, of course, is so important to me. And Lake Ronkonkoma is one of those precious sites that needed to be preserved. Long story short, we started a Facebook page. 300 people join. Five years later, we've taken, you know, 100,000 tons of debris off the lake. They patrol the lake. The mattresses are gone. The construction debris that was dumped there is gone. And people are starting to enjoy Lake Ronkonkoma. We're working on the water quality now, which is a whole nother <laughs> issue, but we do have nitrogen reducing uh, bathrooms uh, that the county put in surrounding the lake. And that's the biggest issue regarding um, water quality for Lake Ronkonkoma. So I'm so excited for the educators that are joining us because you're going to empower the next generation to care about this island that we live on. So Melissa, maybe you can start and tell us a little bit about your program. It sounds so exciting. Um, the fact that you have the day in the life of a river program you know, that's something we should do a story on. <laughs> New stuff. <laughs> Thank you. It's so great to be here. Uh, this is a phenomenal program I'm going to talk about a day in the life. Uh, it used to be a day in the life of the river, a river on Long Island, um, but we have Fire Island with us now. So it's a day in the life of an ecosystem. Um, but a funny, uh, or not a funny, interesting add on, some of you may know from Lake Ronkonkoma, and there, there are now otters that have been identified at, at Lake Ronkonkoma. So it has been um, developed into a fairly healthy ecosystem. <clears throat> Thanks for the work you've done too. So <clears throat> I'm going to share my screen and I'm good to go, am I? Okay, hold on now, this is where I have to go. All right, so many of you on this call uh, our uh, partner in this program that we've um, been coordinating for um, 10 years now, it seems longer, um, just because of all the great work we've done, but thank you for those who are on this call that um, are uh, participants in this. The three main partners, I'll say, is myself from the Central Pine Barrens Commission, Ron Gilardi from the New York State Department of Conservation, and Brookhaven National Lab, Mel Morris, who just recently retired, is really the, the um, conduit of why we started this program. He was up in New York, uh, New York State, and he participated in a workshop on a day in the life of the Hudson River. And he gave me a call and said, Melissa, I think we could do this on the Carmen's River. And I said, Mel, I think we can. So we uh, uh, collaborated with uh, Ron Gilardi and we created this amazing program, which I'm going to talk about. Now we're working with Aleda Perez, 
who is um, replaced Mel as our coordinator from BNL. Okay, so this program is um, different than others. It's not just a, um, a field trip. Uh, we are bringing um, many thousands of students to these locations, and it's just not a one day and done program. So we are introducing these students to hands-on field techniques. They're um, saning, they're collecting water quality, they're doing biodiversity inventories, and they're deep diving into the process. So they're also um, collecting information that we can use as citizen science. So it's just not a one day, it's also a larger program where they can continue to use this information throughout their school year. And it also gives them a snapshot of a larger ecosystem. So I'll show you a map in a moment about the different locations on a river that this information is being collected. And then there's about 10 to 15 other locations on that same river that the same information is being collected. So these students can see not just their specific um, location where they're collecting all of this valuable information, but then they can compare that to the other locations along that river system. So it's pretty exciting. And it's real world scientific techniques that we um, provide or require. So it's just really stimulating their minds and actually even career choices that we weren't even expecting. It's another benefit. So the reason we do uh, this program, um, most of us are out in the fall and it's not the best time for teachers who are just getting to know their students. Uh, but we need that for two main reasons. One is that the biodiversity is still rich in the fall um, compared to the spring. And also it helps us um, provide curricula and information to these uh, teachers so they could use this program throughout their school year and integrate it into their curriculum. So that is a goal we continue to uh, work on. So we do have three main goals um, and then this little added goal that we weren't expecting and it's just, it's um, amazing to see is uh, using the environment as integrated context for learning. We want these students to learn about science, learn about social studies, learn about their STEM field, hands-on interactive outdoors. So it's just a really great way for them or educators to implement their curriculum um, into the environment. And it's been, um, it takes a special teacher. Um, I know some teachers are on this call. I'm very excited to see you. Um, to do this, you're definitely stepping out. Many are stepping outside of their comfort zones, um, but we're here to provide as much support as we can. Um, that includes our teacher guide and the curriculum that we've developed. And the second um, goal is citizen science. And that's what really sets us apart from just a regular field trip because uh, we're utilizing this information that's collected, water quality, uh, biodiversity inventories, you know, what's the pH, what's the DO, what is the um, um, fecal coliform. And then um, we have 10 years of data. So we're able to compare and, and, and see where, how that ecosystem is going, what direction, are there issues that we need to look at? Um, Supervisor uh, Romaine from Brookhaven Town, one of our events is Day in the Life of the Forge River. And we know that the Forge River um, has had its issues in the past. And he's like, put that research on my desk. I wanna see what's going on here and how can we help? So it's um, really a good, a program to make a difference for the future. Uh, so we, we really train these students to collect really good, valuable data and the teachers, because that, that's really important. Uh, so we also uh, connect with not just students, but also, you know, civic groups that like uh, Mora's on this call, you know, um, Walter's on this call, you, that also want to help and in, in, in integrate their goals with the Day in the Life programs. And then, as Danielle, you mentioned, creating environmental stewards, the, uh, the students are our future decision makers. Um, so our goal is to give them um, this inspiration, this connection to their natural world. We have so many stories where there are students who, um, you know, with their, their long nails or their, their high heels and, you know, they're like, ew, I don't want to do this. And Boy, those are the best, you know, then next thing you know, they're in their waders and their, you know, their hands are muddy and they're wanting to know what they're caught in the same net. So it's really exciting to see the connection to the natural world 
um, and inspire additional um, connections with research or even, you know, with civic responsibility um, currently and in the future. And then the really interesting um, goal is, is this expansion of career choices. These students are, are looking at these partners we have, these experts uh, that they do this for a living. Like I, I, I get paid for what I do. This is just, I'd, I'd volunteer to do what I do. It's, I feel very fortunate. So they're realizing that this is a uh, opportunity for them in the future. And many have actually changed their um, goals for college and their uh, major decisions um, based on their experience with the day in the life. So that's been really great to see as far as inspiring and, and helping um, those students who, who found something that they're really excited about. So as I said, this is our 10th year. Um, we started in 2012 on the Carmen's River and then quickly, um, Allison Branco, who was the uh, former director of the Peconic Estuary um, program said, can we do this on the Peconic Estuary? We're like, absolutely. And then Annie McIntyre from New York State Park said, can we do this on the Connecticut, the Nisiquag? Absolutely. So it really just naturally evolved into what we have today, which is 11 events, 11 ecosystems. And this is our um, calendar for this year. As you can see, it starts um, late September and it goes every Friday through November 4th. Uh, we do have events on same days if they're smaller events. For example, Greens Creek and Gardner County Park are the same day, but they're smaller events. We do have about 15 kits, and I'll go into that in a minute, that we provide you all of the equipment that you need to successfully um, participate in this program. So we are able to still have enough kits for each of the uh, participating ecosystems. So just to give you an example. Um, so this is, these are the ecosystems we are at um, currently. And you could see that um, we're pretty much east and uh, we partner with SeaTuck. Uh, uh, Environmental Association, and they're able to um, manage and take on the Mill River and the Carls River. Uh, so that's as far uh, west as we go as the Mill River. But you could see that every ecosystem, every event has a variety of, of, of contributors. It just depends, and there's no, you need this, you have to do this. It just depends on the teachers and what fits their needs. For example, Greens Creek. That is specifically Sable High School. And Janet, I see you're on this call. Uh, it was Maria Brown, now Sonia Anderson um, is uh, handling this. And it's just two teachers go out, sometimes one. Um, they're so good, they don't really need an expert and about 35 students. Then you bump it up to our biggest event, Peconic Estuary. We're on the North Fork, the South Fork and the river. We're up to about almost like on our highest, we almost had a thousand uh, students involved. So it just depends on the ecosystem and the teachers. We're just here to support and help and guide. So as you can see, we have um, on any given year, we have almost 3000 students outside investigating, engaging, learning um, and collecting very valuable data for our future. And then you can see how many teachers we also work with, the number of schools, and we couldn't do this without our experts. So what do you do when you go out to a site? Well, thanks to a day in the life of the Hudson River, they were very good to us and said, what can we do to help you? So they had a teacher's guide and we just uh, correlated it to Long Island specifically. So um, we did it, we put together just such a great document that's um, easy to use for students and for teachers. But basically when they go out to these specific sites on a river, they're, um, broke up into four different groups these students are. And hopefully if the teachers organize, they've already uh, understood what their roles are. Uh, the first group you're going to, they're going to collect physical data, the tide, which is a really cool uh, when you see how quickly it changes. The current, they're throwing oranges and they have their measuring tape and they're calculating the speed. Talk about math. I mean, here's where that uh, it, using the environment as integrating um, concept for learning comes in. Um, wind direction, um, they're using anemometers. So there's the group one. Group two is site description. If you have artists, let's bring them into this map of the site. Um, they're doing the physical characteristics and taking sediment samples. Group three is one that is the 
fan favorite. And this is where it's almost everybody wants to rotate through group three, which is the seining group. So um, as I'm sure all of you know, you, they get this net and they walk out and they collect um, the species and they identify and they document and they measure and they do it three times. So they're really trying to get a nice sample of what's in that um, aquatic ecosystem. They're also doing biodiversity inventories. This is land species, birds, plants, um, mammals, tracks. So it's, um, you know, as, as wide open as that teacher wants to take it. And then group four is really interesting. That's you're doing your chemical analysis. Um, you know, the DO, the salinity, um, and, you know, what really makes this, um, the pH, what makes this location healthy or not healthy. And then, and then of course the bio will also tell you that by what's there. Um, and a really important other group um, that we have uh, integrated into the other four is documentation. Um, photographs of the site, let's see where you are. This, the real big important one is images of the what you've identified. And this we're seeing as something that's important because of quality control. We are um, finding that somebody at the mouth of the Carmen's, it was a couple of years ago, there were 30 striped bass, about two inches long. We're like, eh, those are probably striped killies. Nope, they were striped bass, 100%. So, you know, we needed to see some photographs so we could definitely identify correctly. And um, they were, they were killies. So, um, and also images, video of other, um, your group in action. Um, this is great. I'm going to show you in a minute for social media presence, so press releases, um, and also, um, yeah, working with your local media. We've had News 12 come out um, years ago. Um, Newsday loves this, and local papers um, really love to see the students engaged in the outdoors. So here's some of the press that we've received in the past. Um, it's really just, you know, fun to see these teachers highlighted. Um, a lot of school districts have their press folks too. Um, this is such a great program. You know, let's show you off. Let's make sure that your district knows uh, that you're amazing. Uh, it takes a lot um, to do this program if you're a teacher. Uh, it's, it's, you know, organization, time, energy. So it's really great to see uh, not just the schools, the teachers, but the, also the experts really get um, recognized for all they do. So just um, these are our partners that we work with. Um, those that are highlighted in red are managing partners, and that means they're pretty much on their own. Um, it's really just the three of us uh, that are managing holistically, um, but it's really helpful, like CTUC completely took on the Carls and the mill because that, that eases it up. Peconic Estuary Program helps us with the Peconic, Day in the Life of Peconic Estuary, Sable does Greens Creek, New York State Parks, like I said, they'll always um, help handle the um, Connect Quad and the Nisquag, and Fire Island handles Fire Island. And Save the Great South Bay is exciting because now we're collecting spring data um, because with the creek, Defender program, um, they like to go out in the spring. So it's good to compare that. And here are the schools we work with. Um, we are varied. We all we go all the way to Nassau County, um, all the way to Greenport High School, uh, elementary school, I'm sorry. Uh, so we are just so proud to be working with these, these teachers and these school districts and also these students. And just to give you an example, this is a Carmen's River map. Just to show you the, the locations and how it's really well dispersed. We really want to get a good um, you know, sampling from the river as a whole. So we really are from the headwaters um, with Longwood High School and all the way down to the mouth with Bellport High School. And then um, and William Floyd actually will go out with the South Shore Estuary um, program. I see Sally's on the call and they'll actually get on a boat and go out into the bay and collect data from the bay. So um, the more partners we, we, we have, we, the program expands naturally. So what do we provide? We wanna provide everything we can 
um, to make this successful. So we provide professional support. Um, we have a Google Drive that we, uh, we used to have a website and we're still trying to figure out the best way to get this information to everybody. Currently we have a Google Drive that you're able to upload your data and it has resources, it has uh, field guides, it has everything you need. Um, we're now providing data submission. We're trying to figure out how do we get this data good, this data um, workable. And uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to upload that data just to make sure that what goes in is accurate with this quality control aspect. So it's going to be more on our end, but we really wanna make sure that we could use this data for years and it's good data. And working with BNL is really perfect for that. Um, if you need help with your um, connecting with an expert, um, we're going to find one for you. If you need a location, we're going to find one for you. Permitting, you need a permit. And so we can help with that, et cetera. So we also have social media um, and we have curriculum uh, that we have developed and we keep working on it. Trainings, teacher trainings. We do this every year. Um, River specific. Um, this year we're doing an all in inclusive training on September 17th at Wertheim Wildlife Refuge. And this is going to kind of train the teachers, um, retrain the teachers on the how to's of using the equipment, um, the process of data collection, um, you know, and then it's like train the trainer, then you can work with those students uh, much better. And we'll also our, um, we'll go through the teacher manual, et cetera. So if any of you are interested in this program, 917 at Wertheim Wildlife Refuge, and please reach out to me for that. But this pictures are some of the equipment we provide. Um, and again, everything we ask you to do, we, pro we give you um, that supplies to do so. Um, data collection methods. So over the years, we've always used Lamont water quality um, tests here. Um, estuary and marine, and they're basic. You can do your, um, you know, collection and identify a number that tells you, you know, how is the pH, the phosphate, etc. Now that we want to really hone in on data so we can really use it, um, we want to up our game as far as what do we use for collection. So we're really hoping that we could school districts. Um, we used to provide the kit for the uh, all the schools, but we don't have funding. Um, so sometimes like Conic Estuary Partnership might buy 10 and we, we can distribute those, um, but we do ask the schools to purchase their own um, water. And this is between 45 and $60, so it's affordable. So the next step up is Hawk here, or Hack. I'm not exactly sure how to, how to pronounce that. This is our first year we're recommending these. It's a step up, a little bit more accurate. Um, when you're um, taking in that data. And then of course, if you're with a partner or your school district does have a YSI or a probe, that's gonna get you the best data accurately. Um, here's just a shot of what we give you. This is our Google Drive. It has the spreadsheets. It has fish visuals um, specific to each location. Ron Gilardi did great with that. Um, seaweed guides, arthropod guide, um, whatever you need, um, reading suggestions, et cetera. And then um, school's responsibility. So, you know, you have to have skin in the game, right, to make this successful. And um, so we do um, kind of let go when it comes to the site and the teachers are responsible for the safety of the students, bathroom, there's not always bathroom access, so they make it work somehow, some way. Um, so we um, do uh, encourage or uh, mandate life vests. Um, working with USGS was an eye opener for that. You can't even step up, um, put your toe in the water unless you have a life vest on. And they've seen some, you know, some situations that um, make that um, a, a must. Um, photo release. Um, we want everybody to have a photo release sign. You know, we want to use these photos, use this video. So we uh, really ask them to um, get, let us know about that if there if nobody can be um, photographed. Um, we ask they return all of this equipment. Um, please uh, return it to us the Monday or Tuesday following that program because we're turning it around for that next Friday. So we really need um, that back and we need it cleaned. So that's been a little tricky sometimes because at the end of the day, everybody's just busy. They throw it in the bin and then we get it back. And it's like, sometimes it's, it's funky 
<laughs> so we really ask you to clean those, please. Um, just, just, you know, refractometer needs some distilled water. Um, the Seine net, this is a state park. Um, please bleach this 3% um, bleach solution. Um, if you're seining in the Carmen's River and now you're going to sane in the Nisquag, you know, what if there's some invasive species that are in there? So let's get rid of them. That was a really good um, acknowledgement on, on um, that that's helping us. Um, tag us on everything, take pictures and get your um, school press office involved. So it's really, we wanna highlight you. So these are really the main responsibilities of the um, teachers and picking up their bins at the locations um, of, of the meetings as well. And this is an example of a day. Um, this is um, last year's, right after COVID, we are starting slow. So. Um, typically we'll have like 19 schools from the Baconic Estuary. Um, I suspect will be really um, high numbers this year, but last year we started slow. So here is an example of the school, the location, um, the times, you know, some go for a hot second and some spend the day. So it just depends on the schedule and what those teachers can do. And um, again, we have some great experts that we re that really look forward to this. Uh, event and I think or you know a lot of our goals coalesce you know when it comes to one of our main goals and all many environmental organizations and agencies is education and this just fits that niche so well um, so we really have some great great uh, experts and so goal right use this information don't just go out that one day although if that's all you do that's great um, getting those kids connected is really great um, what we'd really love is that data to mean something as well. So there have been stu uh, students that have used GIS online um, and they've created some great posters and they actually won first place at the International Users Conference in San Diego, fifth graders from Sable um, School District. Uh, so, and also research projects, um, curriculum development, climate change is big. We have a great uh, curricula developed regarding climate change, and this program um, is perfect for that. Uh, so I mean, just integrating into their curriculum would be great. And we are looking at GIS online as well in Survey 123 as part of this program. Um, we're going to do um, uh, next year, we're hoping that it could be um, uh, part of the program, but we're waiting. So just to show you, you know, some examples of these students working hard and, and filling in their data and um, collecting the data, identifying, and um, also just having fun. So it's just been a pleasure to be here. And I, I thank you for having me and I look forward to questions later. Thank you so much. Uh, I have so many questions I've been writing down. It's fantastic and um also i don't know if we have time but just to briefly talk about your bar pine barrens day that you do as well um uh, melissa i think that's important to mention thank you danielle yes so annually in the fall we have pine barrens discovery day and it's just the best day it's at wertheim wildlife refuge and we were looking forward to having it back this year thinking covid's over and unfortunately federal government facilities there still can't do it um, so we are going to be creating a uh, Pine Barrens Day passport, and it'll be out on social media. And thank you, Danielle. I'll certainly send you that information where we're going to ask um, families and students to go to different parks in the Pine Barrens and identify like little checklists to do there. And we actually have trophies for them. Um, whoever uh, identifies or, or does as much as they can on that little passport, they're going to get like a, a bird a bird trophy or a mammal trophy or a pine barrens trophy. So we're trying to encourage um, connectivity and, um, and and integrate the pine barrens into everyone's, you know, the, the communities uh, the best way we can, even though we can't be together in person. But I'll send out that information. And hopefully that will change soon <laughs> that we can get, get kids together doing that. Um, so we'll go now to um, Mr. Basilou's eel grass restoration, which I am just like, cannot wait to hear what you have to say, because um, as we, we know, our native plants do so much for our waterways. They soak up nitrogen. They give our bays and estuaries a, a place for 
habitats that um, there are nurseries for our wildlife in the, in the ocean and in and also on the land. So, uh, Robert, very important work, and um, we want to hear your program. try to get you on here. Rob, you're muted. You might be on mute. Yeah, you need to unmute, Rob. There we go. Okay. Uh, <laughs> hi, I, uh, I started seven years ago with the eelgrass and, and trying to figure out how to bring it back because I know it's been disappearing and uh, it's something I had a connection to when I was a child. I, uh, I loved going in the eelgrass. Uh, I started first without a mask, which uh, isn't a really good idea because it makes your eyes burn. Oh. Uh, after I got a mask, I uh, they couldn't keep me out of the eelgrass. I, I just loved being in the eelgrass, swimming around in it. But as I got older, uh, the eelgrass where I used to go uh, disappeared. And uh, I had a couple things in my life that made me start to look at how, how to save this environment. And... Um, one is is 9/11 uh, really changed my eyeballs. I uh, I really wanted to save some life after that, and uh, so I, I focused my attention on fish. I uh, started off with alewife, uh, a returning fish from the ocean that uh, migrates in our local uh, rivers and, and ponds, and uh, I, I quickly went into um, seagrass, doing a, a seagrass planting with a group called Save the Sound, and. Uh, I didn't like the work that was getting done because it was very slow. And I thought there must be some machine that does this work. This is really difficult and it's uh, it's very slow. So um, I was asked if I could think of a better way to do this work. They were all for it. And I, uh, I took that to heart. I went home and I started researching about this Quartina grass that grows on our shorelines. And uh, within a month or so, I was involved in uh, doing research on eelgrass, which is the completely submerged aquatic vegetation. And, uh, and learning a lot how it's been just uh, been devastated over the years. Uh, started in the 1930s with the, an eelgrass wasting disease that wiped out about 90% of our eelgrass. So to find out that we're missing about 175 to 200,000 acres around New York's waters, it's, a, it's something that really needed to fix them. And, uh, I studied every way that eelgrass was restored and I was thinking there was a machine that did it. And there is no machine that works in the world. So I, I wanted to build a machine. And to build a machine that, that plants eelgrass, you have to have a really good concept. So uh, I, I kept on thinking about what I could do, how I could figure this out. And uh, it, it's a pretty simple method I came up with. I just uh, I thought maybe if I glue these seeds of eelgrass to a clam and drop the clam in the water, because I know clams bury themselves, and they spend most of their time underneath the, the sediment, maybe that would work. And uh, lucky for me, I was able to go to Cornell Cooperative Extension uh, through uh, Chris Pickrell and Steve Schott. They invited me into their labs to try out this method and uh, it worked in the lab. And then I, I started trying it out in the open water and the conics, a small little planting and uh, it worked pretty good. And then uh, I worked with uh, Chris Gobler and, and uh, Brad Peterson from Stony Brook, and I, I did this uh, work to a larger extent uh, in the Shinnecock Bay, which seems to have worked pretty good. And then uh, that was in 2020. And then in 2021, I did it with the Nature Conservancy on their property in the Great South Bay. And uh, that was a large planting, a one acre plot. And uh, I did about 8,000 clams with about 10 seeds each on them. So I used about 80,000 seeds. Uh, I had a couple of volunteers help. Uh, collect seeds, uh, glue the seeds, and then deploy the seeds. So not many, but uh, it, it's growing. It's doing really well. And then uh, I was invited into Hampton Base High School, and I brought my clams and uh, this glue that I use and, uh, and seeds, and I had the students do the work. And uh, about 25 students in about an hour and a half, they were able to glue 10 seeds to about 1,000 clams. And that work went into the Great South Bay and, and is growing now. And uh, working with students in the classroom was probably the happiest I've been uh, doing this work. It's a lot of frustration, uh, getting a proof of concept and um, community involvement and funding. It's, it's, it's pretty difficult, especially for 
for one guy like me. So I, uh, I continue to do this work. I'm, I'm looking to do this work in the Long Island Sound this year and continue in the Great South Bay. So I've been out busy collecting eelgrass seeds off of Fishers Island with uh, the help of uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension and, and Save the Sound and uh, a couple other volunteers. And so I've collected my seeds, I'm awaiting getting permits renewed. And uh, hopefully I'll, I'll have a nice planting in the Sacramento State Park. And, uh, I, I look forward to doing this work more with students in uh, Brentwood High School, again with uh, Hampton Bay High School and hopefully with other high schools. Uh, teaching these students how to do this new technology that I invented is, is pretty great. It's uh, the students were really engaged. I, I realized when I was speaking to them that they spent their whole lives hearing about climate change where I'm a little bit older, I, I haven't. You know, maybe in the last 20 years, we've been hearing about climate change and loss of species and habitat loss, but more so in the last five years, 10 years. Um, so, you know, these, these students, they, they had a chance to, to do some action to, to restore this field risk and, and to learn about it. And then, uh, so what I was upset about was, is that I wasn't able to take the students out to the water to deploy the work that they did, which is uh, probably the most gratifying thing you do when, when you do this work is, is to drop it off into the water. So you know, you know, you're getting this clam back in the water and, and it's hopefully gonna grow these plants. So I, uh, I developed a little thing that we could do this work in the classroom. So I could bring the lab into the classroom and uh, they could glue the seeds to the clam and then quickly drop it into a salt water tank in their classroom. And then they could observe the clam burying itself into the sediment. And then the long process is the germination. The germination could take one to five months uh, for this seed to, to sprout. So it's a, it's a long time that they're being in school, but uh, they could always look over at their salt water tanks and uh, eventually they will see these, this grass growing up. And then uh, that's, that's the great part about it is they get to see the, the fruits of their labors that it does work. And you know they they can do an action to to help restore this water instead of just kind of hearing about how it's all disappearing, and that's what I've been really dedicated to doing. Wow, I, I just have a few quick questions. Does the eelgrass hurt the clam or do anything to the clam? Does it detach from the clam once it is established? How does that work? Well, uh, it's just the outside of, of the shell of the seed that's attached to the clam, which is to the outside shell of the clam. So uh, it doesn't hurt the clam at all. In fact, it actually enhances the clam. Uh, when the clam buries itself, it, uh, it puts out excrement and uh, that excrement gets absorbed by the plant. So the clam will stay in that position longer. When a clam doesn't have eelgrass to absorb that nitrogen, uh, it kind of gets up and move, kind of like a baby in a diaper. They get agitated and they'll, they'll get up and they'll move to another spot and then bury themselves again, which is a good thing because every time they bury themselves, they're bringing oxygen down to the sediment and turning a, a sulfide environment, which isn't conducive for plants and shellfish, to a, a sulfate, which is, is a mineralized version and it's conducive for life. So, uh, but the, the clam is constantly filtering out the water allowing more sunlight for the plant. Uh, plants produce an oxygen and absorbing this excrement. So it's, yeah. it's uh, eelgrass absorbs a tremendous amount of nitrogen. It cleans all waters. And uh, having more eelgrass would prevent, or help prevent algae blooms, uh, denying the algae from having this uh, high amount of nitrogen. And uh, I'm sure that the eelgrass on the clam actually spreads more seeds to the actual bottom well, of the estuary. Well, the right? thing is, is uh, yeah, there's How do you a get eelgrass seeds. That sounds like a really hard thing. <laughs> but there's a there's a few methods to use seed based methods for uh, restoring eelgrass, and uh, unfortunately, they're mostly unsuccessful. And that there's a real need to have a new tool, like I came up with, uh, that works more efficiently. Uh, unless the seed gets buried into the sediment, it doesn't grow. So uh, using clams to bury this seed is a really good idea. And then it's a very strong glue and long lasting glue. It's a biodegradable glue. It's called cyanoacrylate. It's, uh, they use it in fish tanks 
to hold coral to rocks. So uh, when I was looking for glues, that was the glue I decided to use. And it, it was a long-term glue. So as sediment will accrue on a, on a seafloor, the clam will raise itself up to stay in a good position so its siphons can reach the surface so it could uh, inhale and exhale, which it needs to do. So it, it holds the seed in a, a really good position because if it's too, too deep to seed, it won't make the surface. And if it's, uh, if it makes the surface and gets pushed to a, another area, it's open for predation from crabs and fish and birds, and it could flow into a spot that it's too deep that it won't grow. So uh, you know, using the clams is a really good idea. And uh, and we, we we have a lack of, in, in the Great South Bay, uh, you know, we all know that we had a, a complete collapse of the fishery of clams in, in the Great South Bay going back to 1986. But what isn't really as well known is the collapse of the seagrass. Uh, a lot of old timers will say that, you know, everywhere I went, you know, the seagrass used to block up my motor and what a pain in the neck it was. And I had to do this and I had to do that so I could drive my boat. But no one's talking about that anymore. And uh, we know from surveys that have been done in the last 20 years, the Great South Bay, which is the largest extent of eelgrass in all of New York, went from about 20,000 acres to 10,000 acres. So we are losing it very rapidly. And eelgrass is the foundational species that's interconnected and interdependent upon all other species, including our salt marshes and other areas of the world that's interdependent on corals and, and salt marshes and, and mangroves. So it's a, it's a very well needed ecological service that it does. And without it, we're gonna be missing a lot of fish. So by bringing back the species, we, we'll have rapid increase in, in our fish stocks, our fisheries. It's good for commercial fish and harvest. It's good for people. So it's all around necessary thing. So a lot of the things that eelgrass does aren't really well known. It uh, slows down the erosion by building up sediment and attenuating wave action. So, uh, you know, if you live on a shoreline and, and you don't have this eelgrass meadow, you have a 30% more wave action hitting your shoreline, which really will rapidly deteriorate your, your shoreline. So eelgrass protects the shoreline, provides oxygen, and uh, it's habitat for fish. So it's, uh, it's, I'm glad I picked this as my main focus to, to bring back life. You know, and I just want to say, I love that because all of us are part of the puzzle. You know, we can't do everything. And that's what's so great about what I get to do is I get to show all the different people that make this puzzle work. And you're right. You know, when you pick one thing or maybe two things and focus on that, you're part of the solution. So I thank you, Robert. That's fascinating. And of course, we'll open up to questions in a little bit, but we're going to move on to Lou. Lou Siegel. Um, Lou, what, what, do you, what do you think about Robert's invention? I, that's pretty amazing, huh? No, it definitely sounds fantastic. And uh, the loss of uh, uh, seagrass and clams in Great South Bay is, uh, you know, a really significant uh, problem that's developed over the last 20 or 30 years, you know. And uh, if this works, that's great. I mean, as he said, we've had a lot of challenges in terms of replanting the seagrasses, and they are a really important part of the ecosystem in the Great South Bay. So it sounds great, really good to see the results. And so Lou, what can you offer us as far as kind of getting our kids on board as, uh, as stewards of our environment, land and sea? What uh, is New York State educational component to all of this? So I'm sharing my screen now, can you see it? Yeah. Can you, yeah, you can see my screen. So um, uh, let me just get this to, uh, there you go. So um, the New York State Marine Education Association has been around for a couple of years. And uh, we have a website, nismia.org, and we're also on Facebook. And um, if you take a look at those sites, you'll find uh, the different things that the organization does. 
we're in a great position right now. I mean, there's a lot of problems with the environment, but we're in a, a wonderful position in terms of education. Uh, the number of people that are involved in marine education and getting out uh, information about the environment uh, has increased tremendously, the number of teachers. There's over 300 classrooms in New York State without New York City that are teaching marine related courses. So that's a fantastic change again over the, the last 30 years or so, the number of people that are doing this. Um, when I started, uh, when I started uh, looking up some material for this presentation, one of the things that I found was that uh, even the New York State Library, their, one of their programs for the summer was Oceans of Possibilities, about connecting uh, the theme of oceanography with the books that they were directing students to, um, to read over the summer. So I thought that was great, because one of the ideas is to try and get more people to uh, present this material and get more teachers to present this material in the classrooms. So I was really happy to see that. Again, this, so there's a couple of different directions that we could take. First of all, in terms of formal education, that is in the classrooms. Um, if we can infuse marine related material into the regular biology, chemistry, physics, earth science classes, then we get to contact a greater number of students. It's great to have individual programs you know, if you have one really dynamic teacher at a school like Maria Brown, who many of us know, or, or some of the other teachers, um, that's wonderful. But if you could get infused materials into the general curriculum, then you get all the students exposed to the materials. So New York State right now is revising many of their curricula. And uh, in, from 2019 to 2022, most of the work was on the elementary grades. But going into the present up through 2026, they're revising the biology, chemistry, physics, and earth science curricula on the high school level, middle school and the high school level. And the materials that the state education department puts out are general guidelines for what the teachers should be teaching. The thing that should be done is that materials have to be developed so that if you were teaching about ecology or evolution, examples in the marine environment are used to teach these concepts because most of Long Island State, uh, most of New York State has access to the water and it's a great mechanism by which we can teach these general concepts. So um, the energy set, for an example, the energy center, the nature and energy center out at uh, Jones Beach, which is a fantastic facility if you haven't been there, it's uh, only two years old, um, put out, worked with uh, a group of teachers in Nassau and Suffolk County and put out a wonderful curriculum, which is tied to the state uh, outlines, the state curriculum. And um, that's really one of, the, one of the roads that we have to take, that is we have to try and infuse this material into the formal education program so that more students can be involved in it. Um, the second part is to create specialized courses like marine science courses or ecology courses, environmental science research and so on, but this, you're contacting a fewer number of students. A lot of schools don't have the money. A lot of students don't have the time to take these specialized courses. And um, while they're wonderful and they're great and they're something that we should aim towards, the infusion of material into the regular curriculum so that everybody gets it is, uh, is perhaps uh, um, not a higher priority, but they're both very important priorities. And of course, the last few years, we've come up with the word STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, where there's been a big thrust to teach this kind of material. And of course, uh, the marine environment and uh, uh, ecology it could all be part of that. 
So what can we do about this? Well, we're really, really very fortunate on Long Island in that we have tremendous amount of resources available. And before teachers can teach this material, we have to teach the teachers. So there's a variety of programs at the colleges and at uh, some of the nonprofit organizations to teach teachers to provide pre-service and in-service courses for teachers. Um, there's a master teacher program that's run by the state. Uh, the Long Island Sound Study has a mentor teacher program association with Sea Grant which is a, a fantastic program to teach the kind of things that Melissa was talking about, how to do monitoring of the environment. And one of the things that teachers can apply for or school district can apply for is grants from the EPA and the DEC, C grant and other private uh, programs. For a number of years, I ran a, a teacher education program that was funded through a private corporation. So these things are out there, they are available, you have to go out and find them. And in the last uh, 10 years or so, there's something called the NOICE program, which is a federally funded program. And um, I used to teach a course at Adelphi and at, uh, 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 at it, uh, one of the other colleges, several of the other colleges called Marinating Math, Science and Technology. But Malloy, uh, the CIRCOM program that's uh, run by John Tanacredi at Malloy, Mercy College in Westchester, which is run by Meg Marrero. The program is run by Meg Marrero. Uh, Hofstra has a program. New York Institute of Technology has a program. All of these colleges have programs to teach teachers how to do this. And again, Melissa was talking about where she has a training program for the Day in the Life program. It's very important before teachers can actually teach this material, they have to feel comfortable with it. So there have to be these programs to teach teachers how to teach the material to their students. So uh, this is, uh, we're out on, on the, the left picture, we're out on one of the sailboats, the Christine, which is up in Oyster Bay. And this is a teacher uh, education course where we took people out on the boat, we do a dredge, uh, do water sampling, and, uh, and get the teachers comfortable with running this kind of program. And the picture on the right is, of course, kayakers doing the same type of thing from kayaks, doing sampling of material from kayaks and visiting the marshes. And there are a lot of these programs, of course, the Creek Defender Project, I say we're, this is a great time because there are so many programs available. Um, uh, I'm old enough to know that uh, 30 or 40 years ago, there were no programs or very, very few programs that were out there. And now we have this abundance of programs and an abundance of materials that are available uh, online and on TV where you can stream vid various videos for free from a variety of different sources. So we have a tremendous amount of materials that are available. The teachers just have to feel confident in order to do it. Um, CTUC was mentioned. They have some wonderful programs from elementary school through uh, high school and the general public and college programs. Of course, we heard about the Day in the Life program earlier today. NISMIA runs uh, several cleanups. The biggest one we run is all the way on the western end of Long Island, Coney Island, at a place called Kaiser Park. And every spring we have a cleanup there where we have various environmental groups and governmental groups coming and setting up displays for the students. And we have several hundred students doing a cleanup on that particular day. So this is uh, one type of event is also um, I know the town of Oyster Bay runs an event up on the North Shore of Long Island Sound and um, uh, at the Waterfront Center in Oyster Bay. So there are a variety of these programs that are available and there are a wealth of nature centers on Long Island, including the Oceanside Marine Nature Study Area and SeaTuck and SEED and CIRCOM, which I mentioned before from Malloy College. The labs out at Southampton, 
If you've never been out there, it's a wonderful place, a wonderful field trip to take the students. The Long Island Marathon is in uh, West Sayville, um, right near CIRCOM, uh, has uh, some wonderful programs and they have the Priscilla, which is a fantastic vessel to take students out on. Uh, Cornell Cooperative Extent, uh, Extension has several sites spanning the island from Babylon to the Tiana Bay Center to uh, um, uh, to there's two or three other sites that I've forgotten right now, but they have wonderful programs at each one of these sites and they're a great group to work with. And also the South Fork Nature Center further out on the island. So there is a tremendous number of places and sites available for teachers. This is just a couple of pictures, the Marine Nature Study area in Oceanside, which is a place that I went to many times with my students. And these are some of the other experiences. Of course, we go out on boats from kayaks. This is on the Connecticut River on uh, uh, estuary, uh, National Estuary Day in the fall. And this is going out on the Cap Tree Star out of Cap Tree, where we took uh, whole classes out, not to go fishing, but we went out and we measured temperature, salinity, density, oxygen, nitrates, nitrites, ammonia, pH, all of the things that Melissa was talking about. And then we got to sample the ichthyological population using uh, a fishing rod and uh, offering some bait. To, in order to attract the fish. So we did get to do fishing, but we did all of the other things in addition. There are also two historic vessels, or at least two historic vessels that are available for classes. The Priscilla, which is the one that's shown in the bottom pictures, is out of the Long Island Maritime Museum. And you could take your classes out on that boat and have a wonderful maritime experience and do whatever programs you'd like on board and also the Christine, which is out of the Oyster Bay Center up on the North Shore. So there's a tremendous number of, uh, of sites available and experiences available on Long Island, including using these local fishing boats, which are available in the fall during the week. They don't have a lot of people going out on them and they would love to have your students go out on the boat and do have an experience out on the boat. But again, the teachers have to be trained first so that they feel comfortable in doing these things. For a number of years, we ran uh, science conferences and there are several science conferences. One was mentioned earlier by uh, one of the students, Melissa, that one of the students or several of the students had won an award. This was one that we used to run at Dowling College. And uh, then it's a few other sites and you have students doing their own research. And then we used to have workshops for the students and the teachers to attend on the same day. And the teachers are the important part of it, training the teachers through the local colleges, through the local environmental centers. And the teachers have to put in a lot of extra time, but again, they have to be trained so that they feel confident in doing it. The picture on the right shows one of my former students, a guy named Lenny Sparrigan, who used to do some program. He was a, a hard hat diver and a commercial diver. And he used to do some education programs with one or two other friends. And this is him giving a presentation at uh, one of the conferences that we were running. And he had such a great time doing it. This was probably 10, 12 years ago. And he had such a great time doing it he decided to explore becoming a teacher. And uh, sure enough, he uh, went to school and took one of the programs. And now he teaches scuba diving at the Harbor School on Governor's Island in New York City. He's one of the few uh, full-time scuba teachers in New York State or anywhere working in a uh, public classroom. So that's a really nice thing and it shows how if you train the teachers, the teachers will then go on and work with the students. So again, NISMIA has a variety of programs. Uh, we have the website and uh, we have the Facebook page. Uh, we just ran the National Marine Education Association Conference at uh, 
Hofstra College, Hofstra University in uh, <clears throat> early July. And we have uh, speakers uh, the first Thursday of every month online. And um, if you go to the website, if you go to the Facebook page, you'll see the kind of things that we offer. Okay, so I'm- Wow, Lou, amazing. <laughs> I just wanna say that Lou mentioned some really precious, important programs that I've had, I've been lucky to cover and do stories on, um, including the Christine out of uh, the Marine Center in Oyster Bay, which talks about the environment. They do a full day, you know, real immersive um, education program for students, as well as the Priscilla, which is amazing. They talk about the history of the oysters on Long Island and uh, why the oyster was so important. It was literally an oyster reef that protected uh, the South Shore of Long Island and that, that oyster reef is now gone. Um, but what the oysters and our filter, our, our filter um, shellfish do. Um, also, I just came across the Jones Beach Energy and Nature Center, which I didn't know existed. And as you said, um, Lou, two years uh, it's been there, but wow fantastic giving those kids that quick introduction into uh, na nature on Long Island and, and energy and how they intertwine. They also have this really cool um, display about biomimicry, which is a fascinating, I don't think it's new, it's new to me, how um, scientists are studying how nature solves problems and basically taking the sunflower and the inside of that sunflower mimicking it in um, solar panels. And they're realizing that the sunflower absorbs more sun than the solar panels that we're designing. And uh, humpback whales fins are better uh, for wind power because of the, the lumps and the curves in, this, in the humpback whales um, fins. So just really fascinating. And I'm just so happy that you mentioned that, Lou. And um, do you have anything for reporters that we can go to school and learn? <laughs> <laughs> I need to go to school and learn this yeah. stuff. Yeah. Well, thankfully, there's a lot of wonderful programs. And again, we keep talking about it. But Melissa's program that, uh, that uh, has developed so much over the last five years or so. It's been, you know, from a very simple beginning in, 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 10 years ago has expanded to this tremendous network and the Creek Defenders is a, another fantastic program. And just one more thing, Splash. We gave yeah. Splash an award. Yeah. Splash is a real grassroots environmental program where volunteers go out cleaning the marshes mm -hmm. daily. And they're up to, I think, seven boats now that they have on the South Shore of Long Island. But in addition to that, they also have an environmental program. And they work with local school groups and they have an environmental center and it works out great. And lastly, is now you can go whale watching at not only out of Montauk with Cressley, but also out of Freeport and Sheepshead Bay in Brooklyn. And the last week, they've seen, you know, a dozen whales within a mile or two miles of the Long Island shoreline. So if you haven't taken your classes, if you want to get kids excited about the environment, and excited about uh, uh, Long Island and the ecology of Long Island, take them on a whale watch at a Freeport right in the middle of the island. Amazing. I, you know, and one other thing you mentioned that I've been a lot, many of these places, the Oceanside Marine Education Center is magical. It's what a real sea meadow, coastal meadow should look like. It's intact. And you walk out in the middle of this amazing, uh, seagrass meadow and you realize you see the life and I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned that um, that was well, one of the I guess that, we're was, gonna, uh, open it. that was one of the areas that yeah. we took the national marine educators to and they were really so impressed by it you know so it's, it's one thing when we have a bunch of local teachers uh going there but when you have 30 people from all over the country and as far away as Korea walking around the Marine Nature Study Area, which opened, by the way, on the first Earth Day in 1970. Um, uh, and they're really blown away and impressed by it and by the staff there, Mike Farina and the other staff there. 
Um, and that's just one of the several uh, sites that are available on the South Shore of Long Island. That to me, it's it's like magical when I when I go there. I, it's one of my favorite places. Oh, Lou, is there a place where teachers can access these field trips? Do you, there's something on the New York State Education website or is there yeah, the website, there? the website and the Facebook page. We post not only our activities but also other activities of different groups. So it's a it's just a great resource for teachers. And if teachers want to get involved, um, they just go on the website and. Uh, they can contact us there and we always want to get more teachers involved in the programs. Okay, so I guess Robin, we're going to open it up to questions from um, our teachers at this point. Uh, yeah, that would be great, Danielle. Did, I had a couple of questions myself to get it kick started. Um, so tell me, I, as, a, as a teacher, they, they, many teachers have so much on their plates already. You know, how do we help them um, distill down you know, a simple program to choose from that we just, we probably just overwhelmed them with, you know, 20 different <laughs> choices of programs, which is amazing that they can see the opportunities that are out there. Um, I guess one is how do they find the time to integrate this? And I'd love to hear from the teachers on this as well as the panelists. Um, and how do they pay for it? What, what kind of costs are associated with bringing these programs into schools? Well, one of the problem, uh, problems that, uh, again, Melissa pointed out is funding for the equipment. Um, and there are grants available, again, from the DEC, the EPA and other groups, but people have to write the grants in order to get the money. That's, that's the problem. Some of the school districts have grant writers, and um, but a lot of times it falls on the particular teacher who has to put out that extra time and effort to get the money to run these programs. And if you have, if you have a group uh, um, uh, like uh, the Day in the Life program where they could loan out the equipment and then get it back again, that's sort of the uh, ideal kind of situation. Um, but it, it is a problem and the solutions are not easy. It's a matter of coming up with more funding that goes to particular programs that provide these loaner materials like Splash and, and uh, Day in the Life or the school districts actually picking up the course and buying it themselves. And I'd love to hear from teachers, uh, but I also know busing's an issue. You know, I, they're scrambling, you know, even they've reached out already about dates so they could already secure the bus or, so it's sometimes it's contingent on availability of bus and funding of buses. So how do we uh, get the teachers in on this? I'm sure they have lots of questions. Um, do, how do you want to do that, Robin? Uh, the, um, some people are raising their hands, Danielle, so I can just call on them if you like. Oh, okay. Doug, Doug Schmidt, if you'd like to ask, unmute yourself, uh, feel free to um, unmute and fire away with your question. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to, um, terrific presentation. I really enjoyed it very much. Um, uh, uh, cost was brought up and I just wanted to mention the um, BOCES mechanism. I retired from the BOCES Outdoor Environmental Ed Program um, a couple of years ago and school districts can access BOCES Environmental Ed or a lot of other programs, Cornell, et cetera, under the BOCES umbrella and get partial reimbursement back for that. So all programs that schools use under the BOCES umbrella um, receive state aid. So that's something that schools leverage a lot. Uh, BOCES Outdoor Ed, by the way, um, uh, uh, works with about 40,000 student visitations a year, K to 12, heavily involved with bringing the science standards to New York State and how to use the out of doors as a place to meet those science standards, which is really important with the limited time that teachers have to get through their curriculum. If you can do field science, marine work, et cetera, as a vehicle to meet your standards, that's just a win-win. But um, BOCES Outdoor Ed has a very skilled staff. They do a lot of river programs. Um, I'm doing, I'm back as a consultant, doing a lot of Nisiquag programs for um, uh, uh, high school oceanographic, uh, oceanography classes um, this fall. Um, a lot of work on vessels. You can go on the Christine 
for instance, was mentioned, and you can pay for it yourself, full boat, so to speak, or you could do it through BOCES, and um, your district gets money back um, uh, in, in terms of BOCES aid. So, so, um, and I'll I'll, I'll list the, uh, the the number and website um, on the chat um, uh, for uh, so so uh, one option to uh, get expertise for science education in the marine environment and and or to um, leverage your dollars. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. If you put that information in the chat, I'll make sure it goes in our follow-up email out to all Yeah, Robin, just, I'm sorry. I was just gonna say, just to mention, I know we've been talking in the chat, but of, of the contacts, the information, it, it, you're gonna be able to send this out to the, the participants. Yes, I'll send out all the contact information for our panelists, their websites, um, the South Shore Estuary Reserve story map, uh, link to that, and uh, and whatever Doug puts in there for the link to the BOCES, we're happy to share it, and not just in this uh, and not just in this forum for any of our educational partners that are out there. Say the Great South Bay has a fantastic following on social media, and we are very happy to collaborate. We are all about helping each other and. Uh, rising tides lift all boats. So uh, feel free to share your information with us and we are, we're happy to disseminate that. Amanda, um, Amanda Huff, I, I know you have been, um, I'm gonna call you out a little bit here, Amanda. I hope you're still online with us. Um, Amanda has participated in the Day in the Life program, I believe out in the Mastic Beach area. And I was wondering if she would be willing to share some of her experiences with the program. Uh, and recommendations or things that she would do different with it. Hi, good morning. <clears throat> uh, great presentation uh, this morning. Um, it was a great experience for my students. Um, it was the first time, I think we have an AP program that goes out uh, in the day and life of the river, but it was the first time that uh, <clears throat> my environmental science club students had the ability to go to a cleanup and experience that, and they uh, they loved it. Um, and they want to do more of it. So we're looking into um, being more active this year uh, with the club and um, getting more involved. The one thing I have to say that would be beneficial for teachers and trying to get students involved is really, you know, in public schools, there's this hierarchy of um, people that you kind of need to go through to get approval to, to do these things. Um, and I would strongly advocate that. Um, getting chair people or, you know, like a lot of school districts have like a STEM directors or, you know, um, people that need to approve what the teachers are doing uh, for all these things. So teachers, let's just say, I want to do this program. I have to go through my chairperson and my STEM director and then the board of education. So if there's a way, like, even if we, you know, teachers gave, um, names and contacts for those people, um, if they were aware, like as a group of Long Island, um, you know, chair people or directors, then I feel like teachers would have less of kind of like a battle, not a battle, but less of this like approval process to try to get things underway. So for example, I wanna do some stuff in September, but I had to start planning for that in June because if I didn't get the approval, then like, I wouldn't get the approval until let's just say October, November, just because they don't know what it is and you have to, you know, have multiple meetings. So it's kind of like, and of course, teachers can give that information to the higher ups, but I just think like a, a meeting like this for, you know, that level of um, the district would be very, very helpful so that teachers don't have to climb through so many hoops to, uh, to to get to actually getting their students out in the field and, and doing the work because there's also a lot of like concerns as a part of districts for safety, like, you know, just like the life vests and the waiters, but just having students out in the environment, you know, um, some boards of ed are very concerned, like, where are they gonna go? What are they going to do? And there's ticks and there's bugs and how are we gonna handle it? You know, it's not like an indoor situation. I know I'm only speaking for, some school districts and many school districts are open to this kind of stuff and it's improving as time goes on, but that's just some of the hurdles that kind of I've faced uh, trying to get kids involved. I don't know if that's 
helps, but <laughs> yeah, that was amazing, Amanda. Thank you. I just remember uh, being out at that um, Creek Defender event, uh, the smiles on the kids' faces yeah. when they when they uh, were wrapping up. It was, you know, it was heartwarming to see them actually connecting with their literally their local creek that may, many of them maybe didn't even know existed yeah. when they walked out there that that morning. So thank you for your efforts oh. and your tenacity to bring oh. you the program. Yeah, and I was just going to say, maybe Lou, is there something teachers can do that has uh, streamlines that um, ability to present uh, their ideas, their their program ideas? Is there some way that they can, you know, kind of get through the red tape? I guess is what Amanda's talking about. Yeah, there there are science supervisors organizations in statewide and in Nassau and Suffolk County, and they periodically have meetings, you know, and, and this is one of the things that is discussed, you know, field trip, making field trips easier and better and problems that uh, exist. You know, the science supervisors have to, the teachers have to deal with the science supervisors, the science supervisor has to deal with the district, you know. So everybody has their step in the ladder that they have to uh, have to work with. But it, it, that's the problem that I opened up with. You know, years ago there was nothing available. You know, and you had to run out and you had to write it yourself. When I started teaching, I adapted my graduate work for use in the high school classroom, and that became the the skeleton of the programs that I've taught all of the years. But now there's just so much stuff out there is that each teacher really has to curate uh, from the materials that are out there for their particular situation, you know. And uh, as we mentioned, you know, there's a, a wealth of material that's available, like the stuff produced by the Energy and Nature Center, like the fantastic field ride for the Day in the Life program and the uh, protocols that the Day in the Life will, or uh, Sea Grant uses with the Long Island Sound program. Um, so there are local things available. And uh, when teacher courses are taught, in BOCES teaches some in-service courses for teachers, like Doug used to run. And um, I'm sure there are ones that are being taught now. Um, so it, it does involve putting out the effort to really come up with these things, you know. But speci a specific program, there's no specific program that I can point to because there's so many programs that are out there other than the ones we've just talked about. Rose, I see you have your hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Hi, good morning. Um, so I am a new teacher. My name is Rose Bastian. I am a new teacher at Oregon Middle School. So I was happy to see that they were on the list. Um, but I'm curious what the location you for the day in the life um, is for Fire Island, what particular beach you go to. So love Oregon Middle School and they typically do Carmen's River up on Gate G, I think, um, <clears throat> Northern South Haven County Park. But as far as Fire Island, Fire Island's a little tricky because there's limited space. We have um, Bayshore High School at the Lighthouse, and then we have a Fire Island school at Ocean Beach, uh, Woodhull Elementary at Ocean Beach, and then we have the Nature Center at Smith's Point, which is Longwood Middle School. So it's really about identifying if you really say you want to do day in life at Fire Island, we'd have to look at other options or at different times. So if a school Longwood um, is in the morning and you could do the afternoon, you know, that data is equally as important because it's a different, you know, day, uh, different time. So we could work together on identifying a location if that's your um, place that you'd like to go. Great, thank you. Yeah, I was just curious, but I'll definitely reach out more about yeah. Oregon Middle School and what they've done in the past. Great, yeah. And Maura, you, uh, you have your hand up as well? I do. Thank you so much. I'm Maura Sperry. I'm with the Mastic Beach Conservancy. Um, anybody who knows me, I'm totally obsessed with, with <laughs> Mastic Beach and our waterfront. And I see Walt is shaking his head and our waterfront and Mastic Beach. Um, just for those of you who don't know, we have six and a half miles of publicly accessible uh, 
unbelievably biodiverse wetlands waterfront that has a road that we're trying to uh, uh, really a very dilapidated uh, road in a lot of spots. And uh, one of our main goals is to try and bring our underserved population down to the water. Uh, uh, Johnny Panessa, who's on this meeting, is working with Amanda at the high school. Uh, what we've done is, so far, we've been working with Sea Talk and Peter Walsh, who has been amazing coming down, doing the SEN nets. Um, I don't know if people know, and Amanda, maybe you can correct me on facts, but seven out of 10 of our students in our population qualify for the school uh, food program. We are a very underserved community. If you look at the town of Brookhaven, low income maps, you'll see that the entire conservation area is majority low income. And what we're doing at the Conservancy is we're literally doing outreach where we go around and, and we um, ask our local residents and some of the, the, the underserved um, population to participate. We've been very lucky to get people to come down. It's been an amazing experience. And, and um, what we're looking to do is, because we're so young and we're just starting out, is partnering with people like CTUF, with the Great South Bay, to bring these organizations down into Mastic Beach. We've been very successful working with the county and getting Violet's Cove. As you all know, we got a million dollar grant. Uh, we, we have now had um, and architects who are the ones who designed Jones Beach uh, are designing our center at Violet's Cove. The town is doing with um, Autobahn and Fish and Wildlife, 147 acre natural uh, habitat restoration right next to Violet's Cove. So um, what we see happening here is that we've had this untouched beautiful wildlife and wild shoreline be able to be a beautiful park for everyone and the ability to get people in need and to get low income people and at risk people and you know the social justice issues that can be um, really dealt with here in Mastic Beach. We feel at the Conservancy, we can concentrate just down here in Mastic Beach, but we are always looking for partners. Um, and just to let people know the a lot of the new infrastructure bills do have social and environmental justice in the package. And I believe 40% has to be done in low risk, I mean, high risk, high needs areas. And we are looking to partner with and work with people to, to bring education opportunities down here to, to our pot, you know, to everyone as a whole. But we, what I find living here is that the people here seem to feel like they're not allowed to access the waterfront. And one of our main goals is to get our local population down to the waterfront and educate them on the importance of everything that happens here. And I'm really excited. Um, we have Sue Wicks, uh, oyster farmer and former WNBA star working with us. And we're looking to do kelp farming, oyster farming and eelgrass restoration as one of our projects. So please contact us, Johnny or I. Uh, we'd love to work with anybody down here to make our mission um, a success. And thank you for the time. And thank you for putting this together. It's awesome. And Maura, can you make sure that you put your contact information, uh, you know, get that to Robin as well. I did um, a, a story, I think about a year ago with Town of Brookhaven on the restoration of the Mastic uh, Beach Peninsula. Yep. And a lot of it um, began because Sandy had destroyed some many of the the homes there, if I'm correct, and the homes were, I guess, taken over by the town, and but they claim reclaimed the land, they reclaimed the wetlands. Is that restaurant still sitting out there? They got to take that down, right? No, that that came down. We had a we had a big press conference uh, about a month ago, I think. Ah. And that, I don't know why you weren't there. No, somebody else was there from News 12. Um, <laughs> oh, but good. yeah, no, the, it what's happening? I have to say. Uh, County Executive Ballone and and Supervisor um, uh, yeah. Romaine are just amazing in their what they're doing. Um, this community has worked for 16 years on plans, half a million dollars in 16 years through three different plans to really formulate what is. If you look at it, and I think the town and the county have looked at it in depth, is an amazing opportunity down here to create a gorgeous waterfront park 
educational center. Um, and, it, and it's happening. And, and I think with, with what's happening with the new infrastructure bills, if we really concentrated, we could make something truly spectacular down here. So, and, and that's really yeah, the, it's, the Conservancy's main goal is to get that to happen. Yeah, it's truly beautiful. Uh, it's a really special spot. I was, I just was so excited to see how quickly uh, the coastline had changed down there um, from just, you know, I mean, of course, a lot of money and a lot of hard work, but congratulations and thank you more because uh, that's um, just one of, you know, again, one of our precious spots on Long Island. I see, Amanda, you have your hand up. Um, uh, yeah, just really quick. I didn't know how everybody felt about this, but um, this past spring, my students um, entered uh, PSEG uh, Long Island has a competition called I Am Empowered. And uh, PSEG really tried to highlight local organizations that are, um, you know, fighting for the environment and looking at environmental issues. So my students had the ability to research different local organizations and create a public service announcement that was between 30 and 30 seconds and a minute. <laughs> and, um, you know, it gave students the opportunity to do that research um, on local programs and then make a public service announcement that they played at the uh, Long Island Science Museum. Um, and Floyd, just so everybody knows, uh, William Floyd, we had a bunch of winners. Uh, we had like, I think it was uh, nine winners that got like, you know, gift cards, Amazon gift cards and money for our program. So if any other schools out there are interested in highlighting one of the uh, programs that were highlighted in this uh, meeting, that, that's a great opportunity to kind of get students involved, get them knowing what organizations are out there for them themselves to get involved in, and then creating an announcement for the rest of the rest of Long Island community to uh, get involved in as well. That's that's great. That's great information. I'd love to, again, another story I missed, Maura. <laughs> Maura, you had your hand up, I just noticed. Like, no, I was just applauding Amanda on her uh, getting so many William Floyd, you know, Floyd gets a lot of, of uh, doesn't get enough credit, in my opinion, for the great job that the teachers do there. So I was just kind of applauding her. Great job, Amanda. <laughs> Hey, Danielle, if I could jump in for a second, I'd love yeah. to do a plug for the for the Creek Defender program, because this is a really easy way for um, science teachers to help get their kids out onto the local waterways. Um, in the spring, between March and April, leading up to Earth Day, our Creek Defenders go out along the 50 creeks that lead into the bay. And we always welcome uh, student involvement. It doesn't have to be an official field trip from the school. We're, they're done on the weekends. But, um, but for teachers who would like to help us promote the program and get the information out so students can volunteer, I'm going to include that resource also in the post-event follow-up. We, we, we do about 50 cleanups a year. Some rivers get more attention than others. Some need more attention than others. But, um, but it's a great way for children as young as five to get out and get, get, get their hands dirty and really get to know their local waterways. Very often kids walk over the bridge to get to school or drive past a waterway um, and don't even know it's there. So you, once you see things, you can't unsee them. And once you see the litter that is up and around the creeks, I think it gives the kids an, a, a new perspective that they, they bring home to their families. Just to say, as you know, I covered it and I can tell you that, um, I don't know if you can hear me, but that was one of, I got more um, reaction from that story doing the Creek Defender and showing Battlesnake Creek and all that was had been dumped in it and, and the Creek Defender program. People were like, oh, I never even knew there were creeks on Long Island. And, you know, of course we have impoundments that people don't realize that we have creeks and, you know, there's that, that whole issue, impoundments. <laughs> but um, that was like a big, a big reaction to that story. So thank you for that and the opportunity. And 
I, you know, I don't know if we're wrapping but up. I this. So many of these stories, Danielle, could go on the feel good news section. You know, when we see our teachers, they they are our connections to our next generation of local stewards here on Long Island. Um, and they play such an important role. And I, I sometimes I feel like they're they're um, they're not always recognized for the for the role they play in 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 uh, creating this next generation of local stewards. Uh, yeah, so they're, they're on the front line. So that's for sure. Are. I used to have a segment called um, head of the class, I think it was called head of the class. And every week I went to classrooms to document, I always say the miracles that teachers are making across Long Island and how they're educating our students. And it was such a, you know, a wonderful, enriching, beautiful segment that, you know, they cut, but um, I, it was just a joy to be able to do that. And um, I, there's something else I wanted to say, but I can't remember what it was, but anyway. You know, please keep those stories coming and um, I will do my best to get them on News 12 <laughs> as best as I Thank can. You. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So I'd like to say um, if, the, if the, nobody has, has any last minute questions, please pop your hand up. But in the meantime, I want to say thank you so much to our panelists, um, Melissa Griffiths Parrott, um, Lou Siegel and Rob Vassalut for your time this morning and sharing the ways that um, that teachers can connect their students to the to the great outdoors and really for us, uh, most importantly, to the great South Bay and recognizing the importance that this body of water plays to our local uh, economies, our home values and our uh, recreational facilities. Um, Save the Great South Bay stands ready to support teachers in any way that we can. Uh, if you have a question or, or aren't sure how to approach something, please feel free to reach out to us. If, if we can't answer the question, we surely know somebody who can answer your questions or can point you in the right direction. Um, we hope to welcome all of our teachers here and across Long Island to our Creek Defender events and to our habitat restoration programs. Um, and thank you for joining us today. This presentation has been recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel later this afternoon. We'll also blast it out via email. And as I said, our follow-up notes will go out this afternoon with all the contact information about the programs you heard about today, contact information to Danielle over at News 12. Um, Danielle, thank you so much for your time this afternoon or this morning. We know you have a very busy weekend coming up with your, your daughter getting married. So we really appreciate your taking time out of your busy day to, to, um, to moderate this panel. Um, you've been a great supporter of our organization and we look forward to that continued collaboration um, with you. Uh, so with that, I'd say um, thank you very much to everybody for joining us today. And, um, and we will meet up again. Our next speaker series, as Todd mentioned, is State of the Great South Bay on October 14th. That'll be in person at The View uh, in Oakdale uh, from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. with a presentation by Dr. Christopher Gobler of Stony Brook School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences, where he basically presents a, a sort of report card on the data that he's collected across the bay um, if it, is it improving? Is it not improving? The events that we saw this year. Uh, it's a very, very interesting presentation and all that are on this call are welcome to join us for that. Uh, an Eventbrite link will go out for that. So thank you very much. Do you want me to, yeah, I, I just want, want to quickly mention, I just was with um, Dr. Gobler. He did kind of a um, intimate uh, seminar on what's going on with Long Island water. And he talked about nitrogen levels uh, and nitrates and how they're climbing and they're linking it to certain cancers. He has a very factual study that he's done and I'm sure he'll be presenting that as well. So that's kind of like a little um, teaser. <laughs> Not a Thank good you, one, but that uh, the nitrogen levels in our aquifer are, are climbing and that's very concerning as well. So um, yeah. something else that we need our students to, you know, <laughs> come up with ways to get our water clean. Right. Come up with those ways. They first they have to be aware that the issues exist. And right. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's why we're here today. And we, we really appreciate all the um, participation in today's event. So if there are no further questions, we'll wrap it up. I thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, and we hope to see you again at our next speaker series. Bye. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you, guys.